So I understand that uh, later on a paper uh, on attachment networks will be presented, but I thought sharing with you a little bit of the background of the work on attachment network to mother and father, and really to multiple caregivers in the past, maybe 50 to 60 years. I think it is somewhat of an unsettled issue, and I'm really excited to work in on this. And I want to tell you a little bit about the history as well as what we propose to do in order to move the research field forward in terms of assessing attachment networks to multiple caregivers, specifically to mothers and fathers. I, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about the context of attachment. I understand that you guys already have delved into attachment and attachment classifications, but I think it would set up well the stage for talking about the question of to whom do we attach, and then uh, talk a little bit about empirical evidence and models of attachment networks. So defining the context of attachment would start with John Balby, who uh, defined attachment as a means to be strongly disposed, to seek proximity to and contact with the specific figures in situations when one is frightened, tired, or ill. In other words, attachment processes are really become apparent under conditions of distress in which we are seeking, at the very least, a specific figure, if not multiple figures, to soothe us so that we can go back uh, and live our lives comfortably. Those of us who have secure attachment have something of a representation that looks like this. And that could be also pre-verbal in infancy, as most of you know, in the strain situation paradigm, you can see infants behaving, infants who are securely attached can behave something like this. They seek proximity under times of distress or signal for support, such as crying or yelling. And they expect to receive instrumental support, but most importantly, emotional support, which ultimately would lead to a clear resolution of the distress and go back to explore or do whatever they did before the distressful situation have started. But Bobby, and I'm going back to the quote I presented before, said, of course, that attachment means to be strongly disposed to seek proximity and contact, not necessarily to receive proximity and contact. And these are the times, the times where we are having this disposition to seek proximity, but not always receiving it according to our expectation that an insecure attachment starts to form. And when we talk about insecure attachment, uh, just to briefly uh, recap, some of us experience parental rejection, maybe active rejection, such as stop crying, I don't want to help you, but also it can be somewhat of an implicit or passive rejection by simply ignoring our uh, needs for support. Then it creates this behavior of limited support seeking because we know that we are alone in this world and we don't have any, it doesn't make sense to seek support from parents who may reject us when we need them. And we code those infants and children as insecure avoidant. Sometimes for some of us, there is an insecure or inconsistent caregiving, which is thought to lead to excessive support seeking in the effort really to increase the chances of receiving support. Uh, and we code those behaviors uh, or those infants who exhibit such behaviors as insecure resistance. And lastly, uh, and this is Leanne's expertise for sure, caregiver who may be there for us when we need them, but at the same time may also be the very ones who make us fearful, can create a complete breakdown of coping strategies, uh, which we code normally as disorganization. So generally speaking, those early parental environment lead to insecure classifications, which increase significantly the vulnerability to experience developmental trajectories with suboptimal or sometimes non-optimal uh, outcomes. So now that we know kind of what uh, is the context in which attachment processes are developed and why they may be important on how they look like, the question of course becomes, and this is no new question, to whom do we attach? And the history of attachment really implicitly and sometimes explicitly has been, for the most part, we're attached to mothers and mothers only, or at the very least, mothers are the caregivers who really significantly influence the developmental trajectories of the children. And other caregivers, even if we do end up attaching to them, play only a subsidiary and potentially non-significant roles in the developmental trajectories of the children. And this implicitly or implies the monotropy hypothesis according to which it is only one caregiver, mothers for the most part, who really influence the developmental trajectories. 
But in uh, last year, Robbie Dushinsky taught us, among other things, in his book, Cornerstones of Attachment Research, that really uh, there was a massive misinterpretation by attachment researchers of Bowlby's terminology. So really, Bowlby, unfortunately, used a term that sounds like or maybe interpreted as mothers to be the only attachment figures. But really what he did mean is that we, uh, coming into this world, we're directing our attachment tendencies or support-seeking tendencies to a group of specific people. And he wanted to differentiate this group of specific people from many others that we are not familiar with. So this misinterpretation of the original term monotropy was actually contributing to why a lot of, the, a lot of the attachment history was rich with uh, understanding of only mother to be the attachment figure rather than potentially others as well. And this is, again, going back to this quote from 1969, it may again sound like Bowlby meant that the attachment system really is geared towards proximity seeking with a specific figure. So again, some misinterpretations of uh, Bowlby's intentions. But there were also historical and cultural values uh, about caregiving roles, especially where attachment research has been conducted uh, in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, that gave rise to the idea that mothers really are the ones who are dealing with children and fathers are mainly are the breadwinners. And if they were researched, they were only researched for the most part as being absent or non-absent rather than actively contributing to the developmental trajectories of the children. Practical research considerations were also part of why only mothers were part of the research paradigms, mostly because fathers were not really for coming to the lab, for example, when strange situation paradigms were conducted because they were working. And scientific rigor also played a role here because researchers in the past really were not sure that fathers and, and for that matter, other caregivers can play a significant role the development of the children, and they did not want to take risk, which by risk, I mean putting a lot of money and time and effort in assessing other attachment figures. And this is just an example, which would set us off to a potentially later understanding of developmental outcomes, just an example of why mothers are important. Mother-child attachment can predict externalizing and internalizing symptoms. As you see to the left side, you can see that those who are insecurely attached with their mothers tend to exhibit significantly more externalizing symptoms uh, compared to those who are securely attached to mothers. And in the lower, darker bar uh, to the left side of the, of the bar chart, uh, you can see that the same pattern of results also holds for internalizing symptoms. And when you dissect the data on the non-disorganized versus disorganized level, you can see, and I'm moving to the right side of the bar chart, that those who are uh, disorganized with mothers, for the most part, tend to show significantly more externalizing symptoms compared to those who are non-disorganized with their mothers. However, when you talk about internalizing symptoms, there is no significant difference between the group. But definitely it can be shown here that at least with respect to mental health, and this goes with respect to other outcomes such as social competence, for example, being securely attached to mothers is very important to developmental trajectories of the children. But then the question uh, has been asked also, are fathers important too? Um, and a lot of research on fathers, compared to mothers, there haven't been much, but definitely the interest uh, was there relatively from the early on, at uh, the end of the 1970s, Michael Lamb was pioneering this research and focus on fathers. And researchers had been interested in fathers as well, and they assumed the independence hypothesis, according to which mothers and fathers are important in predicting developmental outcomes of the children, but they are important in different ways. They are contributing differently to, this, to a specific developmental outcome, or they are important equally, but in predicting different developmental outcomes. So for example, fathers may be important in predicting social competence and mothers may be important in predicting mental health outcomes. And research in fathers actually really surged recently in two recent special issues in attachment and human development. The special issues were devoted to fathers from an attachment perspective. An interest group of father-child attachment and relationship has been developed 
in the Society of Emotion and Attachment Studies. And very interesting research recently by Audrey-Anne Dunal, who also found the father-child attachment relationship interest group, showed in a meta-analysis that looked at child-father attachment something and behavioral problems, she showed something very interesting. She compared the effect sizes of child-father and child-mother attachment on both externalizing and internalizing symptoms. And you can see to the left side that the effect sizes of both father-child and mother-child predicting externalizing symptoms do not significantly differ, as can be seen on the left-hand side of the, of the slide. And you can see that the uh, 95%, or I think actually it's 80% confidence intervals here overlap. Uh, so mothers and fathers are equally important in predicting externalizing symptoms. And the same goes with internalizing symptoms to the right side of the bar. You can see again, father-child, mother-child attachment, equal or relatively similar, non-significantly different effect sizes when we talk about internalizing symptoms. So we know that fathers and mothers are important, similarly important in developing developmental trajectories of the children. But whereas monotropy has been extended and expanded by the independence hypothesis, the status quo, empirical and conceptual status quo of assessing only a single caregiver with respect to attachment to children uh, and, their develop uh, and, and their influence on developmental outcomes has been maintained. It's either the mother or the father, but not both. But in 1987, Marinos van Eijendorn was the first to suggest that an optimal caregiving arrangement consists of a network of more or less stable attachment relationships between the child and several different caregivers. And he proposed back then, he termed it the expansion hypothesis and now they, and, and then later he reframed it as the integrative hypothesis, according to which mothers and fathers jointly predict the developmental outcomes of the child better than only the mother or only the father um, attachment pattern with the children. And he stated that revising the attachment theory through adding the integrative hypothesis means making a progressive problem shift. So this is essential for attachment theory to start thinking about attachment as network of attachments rather than a single parent uh, child attachment. And indeed studies like this one that looked at the effort tribe in Congo this is a tribe that lives closer, definitely closer to where we first world citizens live, closer to the environment of, of adaptation, of evolutionary adaptation, where we all human species developed and came from. And in those environments, those children who had more caregivers by the first year of their life had significantly higher chances to survive, to stay alive by age three. So there's definitely evolutionary importance to having multiple caregivers around you simply because this is what makes you actually survive. And these are and studies like this inform the anthropology uh, or the evolutionary anthropology, Sarah Hardy, to state that without alloparenting or outside of the family parents, but also definitely fathers, there never would have been a human species. So evolutionary speaking, it simply does not make sense to think about children, for the most part, as developing out of a single attachment net relationship, but rather multiple attachment relationships. And Bowlby also acknowledged that explicitly towards the end of his life by saying that looking after babies and young children is no job for a single person. In 1992, uh, a seminal paper by Marinos van Eijendorn and Avi Sagish-Farts put together and put forward what we know today as the paradox of multiple caretakers. And they stated the following, how can attachment be predictive of socio-emotional development if the child is attached in different ways to different caregivers? Now, think about it. We think about secure attachment and data have shown this. I just presented it as an example, that secure attachment leads to positive or optimal developmental outcomes and insecure attachment leads to negative or suboptimal developmental outcomes. 
We also know that children develop uh, simultaneously and independently attachment patterns to multiple caregivers, mothers, fathers, and others. So what are we, are we to make of children who are securely attached to one caregiver and insecurely attached to another caregiver? This is simply a paradox. And if we are to understand developmental trajectory, we have to start thinking how the attachment network predict developmental outcomes versus a single caregiver attachment. I wanted to share with you something that I believe was interesting because I think it tells a lot about the history of attachment uh, research. The question that I was asking is to what degree have we actually assessed the integrity of hypothesis given what we know now is important to do? And Sherry Madigan, who, by the way, have an amazing database with all the studies that ever conducted attachment in children, and she helped me put together this bar chart. I was asking, I was interested in how many children were actually assessed with strain situation paradigms in the history of attachment. And Sherry said, okay, I can tell you, this is about 20,000. And I know from our research that children who are assessed with mothers and fathers is about one-tenth of this number, which is outstanding. Again, we know that evolutionary-wise, universally and ecologically valid approach would be to assess multiple caregivers, yet in the history of attachment, we barely did that. More interesting than that, when you look at the children who were assessed with mothers and fathers only, you break down this bar to the right, and you ask, okay, well, how many of those children not only assessed with moms and dads, but also we have papers published on the joint effect of moms and dads so on the ventral trajectory. And you see to the left that three fourths basically of this total number have assessed children attachments to mothers and fathers, but actually never evaluated or analyzed the data in a way that allows us to understand the joint effect of the parents. They analyze the data only with respect to mothers and separately with respect to fathers. So something about the history of attachment research simply did not integrate the idea of attachment networks. And perhaps because of some of the reasons that I stated before. So we really only have about 459 children in the history of 70 years, perhaps, of history of attachment theory that were assessed and analyzed uh, under the integrative hypothesis assumption. This is uh, a non-comprehensive, but up until 2018, a comprehensive list of the studies that were published on attachment network. Uh, and you can see both that the sample sizes are very small, and we know that small sample sizes are very problematic, especially because of the crisis in psychological research that we have experienced recently. Simply, effect sizes cannot replicate the results of the studies. And also you can see that the outcomes are somewhat all over the place. Some studies looked at behavioral problems, some said sociability towards strangers, yet others at intelligence and empathy. So we really don't have a clear framework of understanding and researching attachment networks. We have mixed findings and we have theoretical inconsistencies, somewhat of a uh, chaos. And that's why in 2018, obviously, Guy Schwartz, a uh, good friend and a colleague, uh, and myself published, or I guess titled the paper and the problem that we are uh, facing as an unsettled issue of early attachment network to mother and father. And what we said is, or highlighted and revisited, was basically the idea that infants are coming to this world and they are attached securely or insecurely to mothers. But this is not the end of the story. This is only the beginning of the story because each infant who is securely attached to mother can also be securely or insecurely attached to father. And the same goes for infants who are insecurely attached to mother, which creates basically four uh, configurations of infants. So we can think about infants as either securely attached to both parents, SS, securely attached to one parent and insecurely attached to another, SI and insecurely attached to two parents, II. And if you break down the middle group, to, you can also think about infants who are securely attached only to mothers, but insecurely attached to fathers, and vice versa. So infants who are insecurely attached to mothers, but securely attached to fathers.
And this is on the secure, insecure level. You can do the very same thing on the disorganized, organized level. And the last thing that I would share with you is really what we did in the paper in terms of putting together a framework of, or I would say conceptual and empirical framework that would allow researchers to rely on a priori hypotheses in order to launch new studies on what seems to be an important but unsettled uh, issue in attachment research. We wanted to take the integrative hypothesis developed by Marinos van Eisendorn and Avisagish Farts in 1992, and we asked two main questions about this hypothesis. The first question, I would call it uh, a quantitative question, the more secure, does, do the more secure attachment, the better. Our infants who has too secure attachment with mothers and fathers will fare better than those who have only one secure attachment, who themselves will fare better than those who have insecure attachment to both parents. If the answer is yes, then the additive hypothesis would be corroborated because two better than one, better than none. However, and some empirical evidence support the following hypothesis, the buffering hypothesis, according to which it takes one secure attachment to a parent to buffer the otherwise negative effects of the insecure attachment to the other parent. So according to the buffering hypothesis, which is mutually exclusive with the additive hypothesis, children who are securely attached to mothers and fathers will show as good developmental outcomes as those who are securely only to one of the parents. And both of this group will show uh, or will fare better than those children or infants who are insecurely attached to both parents. So this is the first quantitative question uh, that we wanted uh, to ask. And the second question that we wanted to ask is what I think of as the qualitative question. And we focused in this question on the SI group, those infants and children who are securely attached to only one caregiver. And we wanted to ask, does the quality of attachment to one caregiver, mother or father, matters more than the other? If the answer is yes, then the hierarchical hypothesis will be corroborated here on the bottom left. Why? Because children with secure attachment only to mothers will fare better than those who are securely attached only to fathers. By the way, logically speaking, this could be also the other way around. Those who are securely attached only to fathers will fare better than those who are secured only attached to mothers, but we have very little, although existent, empirical evidence in this direction. However, if results would show that mothers and or the children who are securely attached only to mothers and children who are securely attached only to fathers will fare equally good or equally bad, then the horizontal hypothesis would be corroborated, horizontal because moms and dad really are not above each other in terms of predicting developmental uh, outcomes. And when you collapse the first question into the second question, what you get is something that looks a little bit, I would say complex and scary, uh, but really it simply entails one hypothesis from the first question and another hypothesis from the second question. Of course, we don't need to get in details into every one of those models, but I'll just work very quickly with you on this first potential integrative model, additive hierarchical. Based, it is potentially possible that data would confirm uh, that attachment networks to mother and fathers are both additive in nature. As you can see here, two secure attachment better than one secure attachment better than none. And at the same time hierarchical, because if you can, if you can look at those two groups in the middle, those who are securely attached to mothers will show better developmental outcomes or optimal, more optimal developmental outcomes than those who are securely attached to fathers. I can share with you that since the publication of this paper, three more papers already came out on attachment networks. And you can see that the sample sizes are quite large, but you see that outcomes again, although interesting, still are not cohesive in terms of what is it exactly that we expect to change or not to change when we look at attachment networks. And this would be my last slide, but indeed this is a study that 
can be something uh, of interest given the slides that I shared with you before that expands externalizing and internalizing problems into attachment networks. I hope that uh, this kind of uh, introductory uh, presentation can give us all kind of a shared basis to launch our thinking uh, into attachment network. And thank you everyone.